Special thanks to Mark Cox for making this one possible. Hey, Cypher here. Hollywood often likes to make movies about itself. In terms of historical topics, that has to be right up there with Presidents and World War II. It also has a fairly set formula for pumping out biopics. Oftentimes, that means fitting a square peg in a round hole. So today, let's look at a film that combines both of these tendencies with the 1992 film Chaplin. Charles Chaplin, or Charlie Chaplin as he preferred to be called, was a huge innovator in the film industry, but he had a troubled childhood in England. His father left when he was only two years old, and his mother was a nervous wreck. She was eventually institutionalized for psychosis. In the meantime, Charlie and his brother Sidney were placed in various pauper schools, beginning with a workhouse at the age of seven. His father was never much of a figure in the brothers' lives, but he did land Charlie his first performance job at the age of 10. Charlie began as a dancer. Eventually, he became a child actor for much of his teenage years. Finally, at the age of 17, he had become a comedian. This pushed his career well enough to have a tour in America. That tour was cut short because he landed a lucrative contract in Hollywood. He was in a bunch of one-reelers in 1914, one of which was called Kid Auto Races at Venice. Here, Chaplin created his famous role, The Tramp. He already was a star, but this role really launched his career. From then until 1940, he always played The Tramp. He was given more and more control over the filming process, which eventually led to the creation of United Artists. A minor studio and distribution company founded by him, Douglas Fairbanks, Mary Pickford, and D.W. Griffith. Yep, that one. This also allowed him to produce better quality films that took years of production. Throughout the Great Depression, he had avoided switching to the talkies, as they were called. <laughs> Though he used recorded audio for characters other than the Tramp. Hey! Quit stalling, get back to work! But he staked his career and the Tramp's character on an extremely political film, released in 1940 called The Great Dictator. The Tramp gave one of the most rousing speeches in all of cinema. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now let us fight to fulfill that promise. Let us fight to free the world. And that was the last time Chaplin played him. Because Chaplin was a serial philanderer and often skewed toward underage women. Moreover, I've arrived at the age where a platonic friendship can be sustained on the highest moral plane. <laughs> He was hounded by the FBI. He did seem to have a problem with jailbait, and everyone has trouble explaining that away. Her name is Mildred Harris. An actress? Oh yeah. A child actress. You ever hear the word jailbait, Charlie? That's the definition. I'd watch it if I was you. One particular scandal ended in a paternity lawsuit with a 17-year-old. He lost, despite a blood test proving he wasn't the father. You are not the father. <laughs> These things were exacerbated by another overtly political film of his called Monsieur Vado, which immediately flopped. He was taking a vacation back in England when the FBI revoked his re-entry permit because of supposed communist sympathies. Of course, everyone knew it was because he had become a pariah because of his borderline pedophilia. Since Chaplin had never become a citizen of the United States, he was stuck in a country that had become foreign to him. This continued for years. He worked from England and Switzerland, and remained fairly political throughout. He even met with prominent communists like Zhou Enlai, and was awarded a Communist International Peace Prize. By 1972, Chaplin had become less controversial. He was getting very old, so the Academy Awards saw fit to give him a Lifetime Achievement Oscar. 
for the incalculable effect he has had in making motion pictures the art form of this century. This was seen as America finally reconciling with Chaplin. Five years later, he died, leaving 11 children, one of which appears in this film as her own grandmother. This movie clearly tells us what it is used as source material in the opening credits. That is rare indeed. It also engages with this material. Since Chaplin wrote an autobiography, this movie actually interrogates some of the flaws in that book. Parts of the manuscript are pretty vague, to say the least. Bullshit. And you know it. They're right to point that out. This is almost the film doing historiography, and that's kind of amazing. The other book is probably the most important biography on Chaplin, from which all of my sources derive their own stories. Unfortunately, the movie seems more concerned with the autobiography, using it and a fictional editor character as a framing device for the entire cradle-to-grave story of Chaplin. This is unfortunate, because the film could have done a lot better. Hollywood does well with isolated stories, but this film covers everything until the 1972 award. As such, it has to omit a lot and jingle the story around to fit a silly pre-existing biopic formula. Heck, I had to omit a lot in the previous section, but I certainly didn't add distortions. Many people have rightly complained about the framing device bogging down the film, and that is because this need to tell a cradle-to-grave story, especially because the film is more about recreating Chaplin's iconic comedy rather than a character study. But there are admirable traits to it. Robert Downey Jr.'s performance in this is amazing. He is able to pull off the slapstick routine of the Tramp extraordinarily well. They even bring some of it into parts to make clear that there is some heavy fictionalization going on. That is absolutely brilliant. Plus, we do get to see some of those famous scenes recreated, and this is where the movie truly shines. The movie doesn't flinch away from Chaplin's philandering with underage women. <laughs> Don't get any ideas, though. Are you taking that? No, but I'm 21. Way too old for you. In fact, it thoroughly explores that. Well, we've got to deal with the problem, Charlie. You married her. All your life you bedded down with babies. There is a bit of a problem with the interpretation, because the film shows his first underage crush. What are you doing in here? They have a stamp on. But I'm a Charlie, I can't marry you. Well, I'm only 16. And final wife to be the same actress. It is an unsettling way to emphasize what they are trying to say, which is that he was always looking to find Hetty Kelly. It's romantic and cheesy, but let's not forget the underage part. Having a crush at the age of 18 doesn't drive someone to look for jailbait all of their lives. A better interpretive work is actually the book Lolita, which is supposedly based on one of Chaplin's underage mistresses. But simply the fact that the film is engaging in interpretive character analysis is well beyond most filmmakers' capabilities. Of course, there are a lot of problems. Even the actress who played her own grandmother complained about the portrayal, saying, It's fair to say that my father was someone who was absolutely compelled to entertain. But in Chaplin, there was this picture of a gloomy, tortured, moody man. That's just not how I remember him. Essentially, the film gives Hetty Kelly as a version of Citizen Kane's Rosebud. It's really jarring at points, and it's all meant to make Chaplin fit this whole troubled genius archetype. But he never seems to have been much affected by his early hardships. A second key plot point that mischaracterizes the history of this is how the FBI went after Chaplin. It shows this long dinner scene with Chaplin acting silly while Herbert Hoover gives a speech about how the commies are coming to get everyone. Now we are giving sanctuary to the refuse of the world. All kinds of left-wing intellectuals who'd like nothing more than to bring us down. 
This never happened. Hoover and Chaplin never met. While the FBI kept an extensive file on Chaplin, 1,500 pages in all, the FBI did this for most foreigners who maintained such a high profile. Hoover probably was not directly involved in Chaplin's case, and if he was, it's not evident. The movie, of course, also omits a lot. So why include these things that didn't happen? Omissions can be forgiven, but only if they are not intended to give a false impression. The end of the movie makes it seem like Chaplin just started languishing in Switzerland after being kicked out of the USA. But he made plenty of other movies. He even made one lampooning the craziness of the McCarthy era. I'm sorry, I have my finger stuck in a fire hose and I have to bring it with me. A committee cites this witness for contempt of Congress. Yeah, that's Chaplin spraying a water hose at a fictional House on Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC for short. Now I gotta point out that the film makes it seem like HUAC was the same all the way through, because it plays clips from a 1947 hearing right after a mid-1950s clip of McCarthy. But that's a minor anachronism. A more important anachronism is when it shows Chaplin getting a telegram to go to Hollywood in Butte, Montana, when in reality, this happened right after he performed in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It's made out like he was unknown to Americans. But then, why was he there in the first place? Come on, movie. Don't contradict yourself just to make Chaplin into this fish out of water. And that's the point. They tried to fit Chaplin's character into a typical biopic. And it just doesn't work, if you're honest. All that being said, I don't dislike this film. It is more to honor Chaplin's work. The love story and troubled genius stuff can be a bit grating, but that's not the real focus of the movie. It's in recreating the slapstick routine of The Tramp. But if you want that, I'd say follow the movie's own fictional advice. If you want to understand me, watch my movies. House on an... House on Un-American Activities Committee. House on Un-American Activities Committee. Here's an American Activities Committee. <laughs> okay.